New Jersey, New York. 9.30 p.m. by Ben Russ. B-E-N-R-U-S. The shock group watch of guaranteed action. Town meeting tonight. What are the differences between the Republican and Democratic Party? Town meeting tonight. Welcome, town meeting friends, to historic town hall in New York City. For the sound of the moderator's gavel, we'll bring to order another session of America's town meeting of the air. The subject of our discussion tonight. What are the essential differences between the Republican and Dr. Glenn Frank, Chairman of the Republican Program Committee, and the Honorable Robert H. Jackson, Attorney General of the United States? May I now present your moderator, Mr. George B. Denny, Jr., President of Town Hall and founder of America's Town Meeting of the Air, Mr. Denny. Good evening, neighbors. It's frequently said nowadays that the 1940 elections will be the most important held in this country since the Civil War. Certainly American interest in political, economic, and social (coughs) questions has never been greater than it is at this time, and has probably more intelligent interest in public affairs today than have ever been before. In any case, the men between, and by that I mean all of those who listen carefully to both sides and cast their votes for the candidates and platforms they believe will best serve the interests of the country, are watching carefully the activities of both parties and appraising their potential candidates and attitudes on public questions. It's been said also that there were times in this country when the choice of the voters on election day was between Tweedledum and Tweedledee. If that's so today, we ought to know it. However, if we can judge by some of the speeches made from this platform during the past five years, there's considerable difference of opinion between the Democratic and Republican parties as presently constituted. Certainly we've been fortunate in securing the acceptance of these two speakers, Dr. Glenn Frank, Chairman of the Republican Program Committee, and therefore an authoritative spokesman for his party, and the Honorable Robert H. Jackson, Attorney General of the United States, an outstanding spokesman for the present Democratic administration. We'll hear first from Dr. Frank, whose national reputation as an editor and former president of the University of Wisconsin and has been enhanced by his work in his present focus. I take pleasure in presenting to you Dr. Glenn Frank. Dr. Frank. <laughs> Mr. Denny, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I hope my associate, the distinguished Attorney General of the United States, Mr. Jackson, will agree with me that it will be impossible to give much reality to the argument of this evening unless at the outset we define our terms so that it will be perfectly clear what both Mr. Jackson and I mean when we refer to the Republican and Democratic Party. We could talk about the historic record of these two parties as they have operated uh, under fire when official responsibility has been upon them. We could talk about the traditional philosophies of these two parties, ranging over the policy pronouncements of Hamilton, Jefferson, Lincoln, and Jackson, at least Andrew Jackson. We could, we could, I suspect, give you a fairly colorful evening if we condescended to personalities, historic and contemporary, and centered our attention on isolated uh, party episodes, each undertaking to muckrake the party of the other. But I am not, and I suspect Mr. Jackson is not, interested in any of these approaches to this question. I am not interested in any of these approaches because I think they have little, if any, relevance to the political decisions and practical interests of the American people in 1940. In these later years, life has laid too heavy a hand upon too many of us. Fortune has failed to smile upon too many of us for me to believe that many Americans will cast their votes in 1940 in terms of the history of our two parties. Few emotions will be stirred in 1940 by obsolete slogans or by the waving of faded battle flags woven out of the issues of other generations. Men without a job, staggering under unbearable debt, with their backs bending under a back-breaking taxation, women watching the loss of their homes, and youth staring at doors of opportunity 
barricaded by a sluggish enterprise, are not, not going to spend much time raking over the ashes and the embers of political history. And, of course, the fact is that traditionally, except for variations of emphasis in this decade or that, there have been no essential differences between the Republican and Democratic parties in their political and economic philosophy. Variations, yes, but in essence, both have grounded their governing upon a political philosophy of democratic self-government under the check and counter-check of distributed and balanced power, an economic philosophy of private enterprise under the minimum governmental regulation necessary to prevent abuse and promote justice in its operation, and if I may use the term, a spiritual philosophy of civil liberty under which freedom to think, to write, to speak, to petition, to worship, and to participate in political opposition were supposed to be secure from denial, from vindictive harassment, or assault even by government. Now, I used to think this long-standing similarity between our two parties was to be deplored. I don't any longer. I am now convinced that it's impossible to operate a great nation under the two-party system with any degree of stabilized well-being unless the two parties are in essential agreement on their political and economic philosophy. If a two-party system is made up of two parties whose political and economic philosophies are at opposite poles, then every election overturn becomes, in effect, a revolution. And the whole national enterprise is disrupted, thrown out of gear, and for a run of years, at least, shrouded under a depressing shadow of uncertainty. And surely no effective light would be thrown on the immediate importance of the question we're discussing if Mr. Jackson and I attempted to muckrake our respective parties. Both parties, being made up of human beings, have had their share of great statesmen and crooks. Both have had their phases of high advance and low retreat. Both have at one time or another been, have served the many and have been exploited by the few. And at varying levels of local, state, and national government have had their share of scandals and of superb service. No, the only difference worth discussing tonight is the difference between the policy and action followed by the New Deal administration during the last seven years. The fortunes of balloting return the Republicans to power next November. Now, you may say that's hardly a fair way to state the question because judgment on the New Deal can be based on a record. While it might be said judgment on the probable policy and action of an incoming Republican administration would have to be in the nature of, of a prophecy, and that such prophecy made in advance of the platform the Republicans will adopt and the uh, candidate they will nominate at Philadelphia next June can only be a guess. How can anybody know, you may ask, what forces will draft the platform and what behind-the-scenes deals will dictate the leadership at Philadelphia. Now, ordinarily, in any party, both this observation and this question would be valid. But I speak with a feeling of unusual certainty tonight about the probable platform and probable kind of leadership of 1940 Republicanism, because I'm not basing my judgment on a guess about forces that will operate in Philadelphia or deals that might be attempted. I'm basing my judgment on a first-hand knowledge of what the rank and file of Republicans are thinking and feeling today. And what the rank and file of Republicans are thinking and feeling is today more important than what any individual Republican leader is thinking. I think I know I think I know what is today moving in the minds and hearts of the mine run of Republicans from coast to coast. I think I know first because I'm one of them. And then for the last two years, I've been at a very unusual listening post. As chairman of the Republican Program Committee, I've had the chance to eavesdrop the minds and hearts of thousands upon thousands of rank-and-file Republicans throughout this nation. And unless my hearing's been very bad, 
I know what these rank-and-file Republicans are saying among themselves. And I say to you tonight that if there is a spirit of blind reaction in the rank-and-file Republicanism of this country, I've been unable to find it with a dragnet of research and referendum in the last two years. The rank and file, the rank and file Republicans of this country, as I've come to know them in these two years, are not hidebound. Neither, thank God, are they harebrained. They are generally and justifiably skeptical of political medicine men. They do not belong to the decay school of thought which has captured so many official liberals in these later years. These rank-and-file Republicans simply do not believe the assumption current in so many quarters just now that the America we have known, the America of political liberty and private enterprise, is a dying America except as the political pull motor of the federal government can keep it breathing. They believe, not as wishful thinking, but as obvious fact, that American enterprise can expand more can offer more investment opportunities for our savings, can provide more jobs for workers in factories and on farms, create more profitable outlets for the energies and genius of the people, and lift the living standard immeasurably higher in the next 25 years than it did in the 25 years before 1929, if the public policies of government or the private policies of business don't throw too many obstacles in its way. Now, these rank-and-file Republicans don't believe that the ranks of businessmen, industrialists, and bankers are devoid of intelligence, competence, and social sensitiveness. They don't think that the political genius of the nation is bankrupt so far that it has to be put under a receivership of appointed administrators. They believe there's a vast fund of leadership in this nation that is suffering neither from the rigor mortis of reaction nor from the St. Vitus dance of irresponsible utopianism. And they think... And these rank-and-file Republicans think that it's the business of the Philadelphia Convention to find that sort of leadership so they can follow it and help it lift the standards around which the stable intelligence, the effective competence, and the sound social sense of Americans who believe in democratic self-government and an intelligently modernized system of private enterprise can rally. Now, this rank-and-file republicanism is not a do-nothing republicanism. It's not allowing either vested interests or vested ideas to obscure its understanding of these social and economic needs to which political policy must today be related or meet deserved rejection at the hands of an enlightened people. This rank-and-file republicanism does not want to repeal a single law that has actually restored or strengthened value. It does not want to repeal a single tax that is needed for essential public service unless it's a tax that is hampering the needed expansion of industry and business upon which the essential, every essential service of government ultimately depends. It doesn't want government to wash its hands of concern with the future of agriculture or see labor face management without the full advantage of equal bargaining power. It doesn't want to see homeowners pay exorbitant interest rates or lose their homes. It doesn't want to see a single American go hungry or houseless or cold. It doesn't want to see government relax effort in behalf of the unemployed. And it doesn't want to see the country handed over to the manipulations of dishonest speculators. It doesn't want to delay by one unnecessary hour the utmost feasible security for the aged or sabotage any intelligent attempt to raise the standards of health and education. Now, this rank-and-file republicanism of 1940, as I've come to see it, is an alert, eager, socially sensitive, progressive republicanism. And any leadership that undertakes to thwart it or fails faithfully to express it will be broken. Thank you, Dr. 
Dr. Frank. One of the most distinguished members of the present administration is the Attorney General of the United States, a native of Jamestown, New York, and successively Assistant Attorney General and Solicitor General, and a distinguished and an eminent Democrat. I take pleasure in welcoming back to the town hall platform the Honorable Robert H. Jackson. Mr. Jackson. <laughs> Citizens of the town meeting, since the subject for tonight was chosen, world events have made the differences between us Americans seem trivial. Beside those deep differences of systems and cultures that men are dying for abroad. We, Dr. Frank, may be grateful that our differences are only those which can be settled at the ballot box. And while we differ in detail, we have no disagreement in wanting to continue the fundamental principles of our government and of our society. In fact, Dr. Frank and I agree too on too many points to make this a real jolly evening for you. Before the New Deal, there was frequent complaint by thoughtful people, some liberal and some conservative, that there was no real difference between the Democratic Party and the Republican Party. Since the Democratic Party has been under the leadership of President Roosevelt, that complaint has been less frequent. <laughs> nearly every partisan Democrat and nearly every partisan Republican agree that there are fundamental differences between the Democratic Party and the Republican opposition. But it is difficult to get them to agree on a statement of these fundamental differences. If a man from Mars should examine the New Deal record and then read the modernized statement of Republican doctrine prepared by Dr. Frank and his battalion of brain trusters, 200 experts strong, he might conclude that Dr. Frank's work was a defense of the Roosevelt record. <laughs> uh, certainly, certainly he would conclude that most of the ideas discussed by Dr. Frank came from President Roosevelt. The Republican program of Dr. Frank accepts in principle minimum wage and maximum hour legislation, federal subsidies to agriculture, soil conservation, and housing pro programs. The elimination of tax-exempt securities, the regulation of stock markets, security issues and public utilities, and even government competition to some extent in the power industry. It favors such bitterly contested policies as collective bargaining for labor, reciprocal trade agreements, relief for the unemployed, and the social security program. It is content if the budget is balanced and not before the election of 1942, and is content if we return to a fixed gold standard at some indefinite date. There are, to be sure, guarded suggestions in the, in the report that the New Deal record is not perfect, and that there remains much to be done to satisfy the promise of American life. But such criticisms are, on the whole, more tempered than many I have heard from New Dealers. There is nothing in the uh, Glenn Frank document that suggests a fundamental difference in objective or approach from Mr. Roosevelt. Our man from Mars might well wonder whether the Republican brain trusters could find a better leader to fight for their principles in 1940 than Franklin D. Roosevelt. <laughs> I do not want to give an exaggerated impression of the wholeheartedness of the committee's endorsement of the New Deal. There are plenty of hedge clauses in the report which can be cited to convince reactionaries and contributors that the road back to normalcy has not been cut off. One of the most forceful illustrations is the proposal to return to the Mellon system of taxation. Every tax imposes some economic burden on those who pay it. The historic position of the Democratic Party is that this burden should be placed where it can most easily be carried and that taxes should increase in proportion to ability to pay. In this respect, although it advocates budget balancing, Dr. Frank's report proposes to lower the taxes on the higher incomes. It proposes the repeal of the capital stock tax and the repeal of the excess profit and repeal of the normal tax on dividends. It is very significant that not a single proposal is made to lighten the burden of the income tax or any other tax. 
on the wages, salaries, or earned income. The only tax relief proposed is to those who are living on investments rather than on their services to society. A similarly reactionary position is taken to the committee with respect to government relief and work for the unemployed. The committee proposes, to the largest extent feasible, to take this burden from the federal government, which can tax incomes and inheritances, and to place it on local governments, which can effectively tax nothing much but real estate and retail sales. The people will not and should not stand for more sales taxes. And real estate taxes have already been carried to the breaking point for the poor and middle class homeowners. To put the cost of relief on real estate means to end relief. Even under our present system, the Republican governed state of Ohio has witnessed relief riots. A cruel society cannot be a stable society. And I want to live in a stable and peaceable order. If our federal government ceased to aid the unemployed, the aged, and the farmer, our civilization would become at once the richest and the most cruel in modern history. We must balance our economic system with a purchasing power equivalent to our producing power. Also, we must boldly face the problem of how to preserve equality of economic opportunity and political democracy in the face of the rising power and influence of great accumulations and combinations of wealth. The real powers in the Republican Party contend, and I think that they honestly believe, that economic opportunity and security for the great majority of our citizens is unattainable by government effort. They still cherish the belief that government help can be sound and effective only if it trickles down from above and takes the form of tariffs, subsidies, tax relief, and other incentives to those already on the upper scales of the economic ladder. I do not mean, of course, to suggest that there are not many things that government may properly do to energize private enterprise. But there is a difference between those of us who believe that the task of government is to promote the general welfare and those who believe that government should only help those best able to take care of themselves. What therefore distinguishes New Deal democracy from its opponents is that we would use the powers of government in a conscious effort to attain and to distribute a high level of production and prosperity not for a few but for the many. To understand the differences between the two major parties, we must look not only at their words, but their deeds. I am well aware that the promises of statesmen of all parties excel their performance. But it is fair to look at the promises and performances of the Republican Party when it was in power, and the promises and performances of the Democratic Party under President Roosevelt. We find a distinct difference in the approach and attitude of the two major parties toward the government's responsibility to its people. It may not be easy to state this difference, but it is very real in the minds and hearts of the voters. Is it unfair to doubt whether the objective of the Dr. Frank report, uh, which the Dr. Frank report accepts in principle, represents the real attitude of men who were hostile or indifferent when President Roosevelt and his party were struggling to write into law such requirements as that of truth in the sale of security, fair play on the stock exchanges, a limitation of the right of super utility holding companies to play with other people's property, the right of workers to bargain collectively, the provision of jobs instead of a dole for the unemployed, the right of un uh, to unemployment, and to old age insurance. Is it unfair to ask when, and for what reason, those who bitterly opposed or grudgingly accepted these great reforms decided that they want to improve them and extend them and administer them better? If the Republicans now concede these principles to be sound and wise, why has President Roosevelt's effort to put them into practical effect won him such deep and lasting hatreds from the financial backers of the Republican Party.
Dr. Frank's report does not sharpen or define these real underlying issues between the two parties as now constituted and led. It is to be feared that the party platforms, if they are made up of the usual timid generalities, will also fail to disclose their really opposite objectives. The intuition of the people will sense the difference better than it can be stated. President Roosevelt has more than once warned against these smooth evasions of the real issue, which say to us, of course we believe in all these things. We believe in social security. We believe in work for the unemployed. We believe in saving home. Cross our hearts and hope to die. We believe in all of these things. But we do not like the way the present administration is doing them. Just turn them over to us. We will do all of them. We will do more of them. We will do them better. And most important of all, the doing of them will not cost anybody anything. The next administration may deal with severe tensions in our society. Its dominant task will be to re-examine governmental policies in the light of our experience. We must complete a long-term program to take the place of short-term remedies and emergency experiments. Although we stand aside from the European conflict, our economy, our social life, and our thinking will not escape its far-reaching effects. Victory will bring prestige to the ideas and the systems and the doctrines of a successful country. We must face the peace of Europe, which may test our stability even more than the war of Europe. We do not know what modifications of their way of life and what reorganization of their economy even the democracies of Europe may make in order to win the war. Ideas or practices that bring victory will exert new pressures. In this competition of ideas and loyalties, our system of representative democracy belatedly has undertaken to provide economic opportunity and security for all of our people. There is no wisdom in turning back. There is no time to wait. It is later than you think. Thank you, Mr. Jack. Before our question period, we pause now for station identification. WJZ, New York. Continuing America's town meeting of the air from town hall, you've just heard our speakers, Dr. Glenn Frank and the Honorable Robert H. Jackson, stating their respective viewpoints on the question, what are the essential differences between the Republican and Democratic parties? Before we give the members of our audience their opportunity to question the speakers, as this is our last program of the season, I have an exceedingly important announcement to make. Many times I've reminded you that this is your town meeting of the air. Each week, our mail indicates that new listeners join our audience, and new discussion groups are listening in from all parts of the country. Through the miracle of radio, the old New England town meeting is experiencing a rebirth, and tonight is an example of it. Americans everywhere are finding that the town meeting spirit can be used to help in the solution of controversial problems wherever they exist. As you know, these sessions of America's town meeting of the air, to which you've been listening, are presented jointly by the National Broadcasting Company and Town Hall. Town Hall itself is a nonpartisan, non-sectarian educational institution which has been serving the people of New York since 1894 and America through the cooperation of the National Broadcasting Company since May 1935. Two weeks ago, Town Hall launched a 50th anniversary campaign through which we hope to accomplish two things as we round out half a century of service in 1894 and 1944. First, by our 50th anniversary in November 1944, we hope to have tremendously increased the number of town meeting discussion groups and local town halls as educational centers throughout the country. Second, in order to make this possible, our building from which these broadcasts originate has to be enlarged so that it can house both the local and national programs. Many of you have read or are reading the details of this program in town meeting, the weekly bulletin of these broadcasts. And many of you know that a fund of $1,522,000 is being raised for that purpose. No matter where you live, in town, city, or country, you can use the town meeting method to your advantage. And that's the important thing. 
If you want to know more about our plans and want to cooperate with our 50th anniversary campaign, send your inquiries as soon as possible to the Town Hall, 123 West 43rd Street, New York City. And now we're ready for the question period. For the members of the audience who want to ask questions, please rise and state the name of the person <coughs> to whom your question is directed. Questions, please. We'll start uh, in the balcony. The gentleman right there in the center in the gray suit, yes? Dr. Frank. Dr. Frank. Dr. Frank, we've had the experience. Many of us have good reason to doubt the words, just the words of the Republican uh, platform. Now, I'd like to ask you specifically, if Republicans get in in 1940, what will be their attitude towards the way to the now is so? Not All right, we got it. Thank you. What will be the Republicans' attitude toward the wages and hours bill if they're elected in 1940? I can only give you the attitude taken by the Republican Program Committee. Since the Republican platform hasn't yet been written, that'll be written in Philadelphia in June. The attitude of that program report was not in violation of the underlying principle of minimum wage and maximum hours for the protection of those unable to protect themselves through collective bargaining, but was for such principles. And I have given you my judgment that the process of the program committee is an accurate reflection of a rank-and-file sentiment, point of view, and attitude, which in my judgment will dominate and color the policy of the Republican Party, either both during the campaign and after the election. Frank. You spoke at great length about a new and intelligent political and economic outlook of the rank and file Republicans. Will you be kind enough to advise since when and ever have the rank and file Republicans chosen presidential candidates at a national convention? And the question really is, since when did the rank and file of the Republican Party, and I suppose of any party, choose the candidates at a convention? Again, that's of a piece with the answer I made in part on the wages and hours question. Uh, during the last two years, the Republican Party has been engaged in an extensive process of thoroughly democratizing one of the most important, important party processes, namely the formulation of policy, and doing it at a time when the Democratic Party's process of policy-making has been becoming increasingly autocratic and centralized. That is not true that during the application of the so-called Mellon tax schedules running lower on high-income tax returns, that more money was taken in in those higher brackets in tax collections than was taken in under the higher taxes before that and the higher taxes today on those incomes. Okay. The question as to the amount, I haven't the figures in mind. But of course, the net collections of the government depend not merely on the rate, but upon the number of people who enjoy those incomes. There were more people who enjoyed, or thought they enjoyed, those incomes in 1929 and those years before, and reported on that basis. I don't think that you can successfully contend that a low rate will apply, will produce more income for the government if you apply it to the same base. You're applying two different eras, comparing two different eras and applying to them two different bases. Thank you. Next question. Right. Let's take the first part of that question first. Yeah. Yes. We'll leave off the last one. That's too long. But the first part of the question is, do you agree that the statement that that government, yes, the government police applies in 1940? I do not believe that the bald statement 
That government which governs least is the best government applies to the complicated and interdependent situation of 1940 in this or any other modern civilization. Uh, let's have one for Mr. Jackson. We've got a question for Mr. Jackson. Can you there? All right. Mr. Jackson, don't you think that one of the prime differences between the Democratic and Republican parties is that the Democratic Party in their administration promulgates various uh, progressive legislation, legislation that seems radical at the moment, and then when their term is up, Republicans come in for a number of uh, administration and mellow and sanctify this legislation. <laughs> I take it that the question is the Democrats, Jackson. I'm, I welcome him as such. And I, I endorse his uh, statement. Now we'll take a question from Dr. Black. Dr. Black, you don't see very many essential differences between the two parties. But uh, don't you find in the statements of the Honorable Mr. Jackson the, uh, uh, the statement as to the performance in Congress where the Republican Party has tried to nullify the efforts of the Democratic Party along progressive lines? An essential difference right there. How about the action in Congress? I would be, as, a, as one of the mellowers and sanctifiers, <laughs> other... <laughs> Or to put it in short, no, I, I want to answer that question, Mr. Denny. Yes, sure, sure. In other words, in shorthand, as a Republican, I would be perfectly happy to have someone who knew the details make a detailed comparison between the uh, cordial cooperation of the Republican forces uh, under the New Deal with valid progressive legislation with the obstructive forces of the democratic element in the Congress when the Hoover administration was advancing. <laughs> was when, when that administration, which has been so heartily maligned by the New Deal leadership, was undertaking to advance highly progressive legislation on many fronts, and it was impossible to get through a democratically controlled house, even progressive banking legislation. I recognize a distinguished Republican in the audience is about to ask a question, Mrs. Preston Davy. Mrs. Davy. Yes. Yes. I would like to ask you how the new deal is suggested proposal to reinstall the 11 million unemployed if it continues with punitive policies toward business and the harassment of business. Uh, Mr. Jackson. There has been no punitive policy toward business. There is no... <laughs> there has been a distinct effort to curtail some kinds of business in the interest of other kinds of business. The Federal Trade Commission acts on a complaint by some businessmen that other businessmen are being unfair to it. Every suit that has been instituted by the Department of Justice <clears throat> against business groups has been instituted at the request and upon the complaint of other groups of businessmen who claimed they were being ruined. Government must arbitrate those differences and must take a position in reference to those groups. I'd like to address my question to both speakers. In the light of recent foreign developments, do you think America should continue to purchase gold from foreign countries so as to create purchasing power in those foreign countries so as to aid our foreign export trade? That's right. Well, now that's a question on money. Now you're getting over into the field of money, and when you get there, I'm in exactly the same position that the monetary experts are. I don't know a single thing about it. <laughs> Except instead of saying, don't you, should we continue to buy the gold? I think it would have been far better if we hadn't bought as much as we have. 
Jack, you know anything about money? <laughs> it's very fast that that isn't one of the differences between Dr. Frank and myself. <laughs> the question is addressed to the differences between us. All right. Thanks, sir. Well, I'll ask Mr. Jackson. What new plan, if any, has the present administration to put to work the idle money in this nation? And I want to ask Mr. Frank what his party would do about it. Yes, ask him the same question. What new plan has the present administration for putting idle money back to work? The administration has had a program of attempting to raise the purchasing power of the people in the lower class income groups who are the great purchasers of the nation. Those are the groups that spend their money. If you recall when the depression hit the motor industry, one of the explanations which was given was that there was no longer uh, ability to dispose of used cars. And used cars are the products which are sold to people of low income. It's the belief of the uh, group uh, that if you can restore purchasing power so that business has customers, the idle money will go to work supplying the needs of those customers. And that primarily the reason that business is down is because customers aren't available to buy its goods. Now, Dr. Frank, will you comment on that same question? Thank Ms. Thanks to Mr. Jackson for dramatizing at least one very profound difference between the Democratic and Republican parties today. I agree with Mr. Jackson, and I agree with the most ardent New Dealers that you can't keep this high-powered, productive system going without customers who have money in their pocket with which to buy the output of that productive system. But I dissent heartily, as does the Republican Party generally from the idea that you can create purchasing power adequate to keep this high-powered productive machine going by either government-made work or elaborate government spending of borrowed money. <laughs> As a very temporary shot in the arm to overcome a serious, acute condition, yes, as a going economic process, no. All the record of the experiment is against it. Thank you. <laughs> you want to know whether what definite step your party will take to keep America out of war. Oh. You want to know what definite steps your party will take to keep America out of war. I think the program of the administration has been made very clear in the uh, legislation which was proposed by the president and enacted. There has been no indication of a likelihood of our getting into the war. And the legislation is certainly adequate up to any present need. Thank you. The question is, what proposals does the Republican Party have for putting the 10 or 11 or whatever number of millions of unemployed there are back to work? Every attitude, every ex expression of the temper of Republican leadership, and every policy incorporated in the report of the Republican Program Committee was directed at the target of revitalizing and re-energizing the basic health of American business, industry, and agriculture on the assumption that only as the organic health of the economic enterprise of this entire nation is returned are you going to get a genuine reabsorption of the unemployed into the ranks of the employed. You can't do it on made work unless you want to stabilize the living standards of this people at a markedly lower level. And 
herd them into armament plants or troop them down the street on made work. President Hoover's reaction to your report. Is he opposed to it? I can answer that question. Mr. Hoover was a member of the committee, cooperated in the drafting of the report, and the last time I heard him refer to it, he said he felt it was an excellent expression of the political, social, and economic principles in which he had believed and which he had preached for the last 20 years. I'd like to ask one question, Mr. Jackson. Do you or do you not believe that the existence of a national deficit of 40 billion plus is a national peril? Is a deficit of 40 billion, is a deficit of 40 billion plus a peril? To be perfectly frank with you, I don't know. I have read a great deal that has been written on both sides of the subject. Whether it's a peril, I can't answer. It doesn't seem to me that a deficit created to feed our own people, a deficit for public works which are created in this country, represented by schoolhouses and projects throughout the land, can bankrupt. Same question. Mr. Frank, do you think that that, that aid deficit of 40 billion plus is a national peril? You mean the national, a national debt of 40 billion dollars? Yes. <laughs> now I say that. Now let me make clear the spirit in which I say it and the grounds on which I say it. And about three sentences will state those grounds. I do not say that potentially this economic system of ours can't stand up under a national debt of 40 or even 50 billion dollars. But I do say that a national debt that has jumped, that has virtually doubled in seven years is symptomatic of a political and economic philosophy which, if given its head, will land the nation in bankruptcy because of the policies that create that larger debt. Thank you. After having heard this talk on both sides of the very few differences between the Democratic and the Republican Party, I wish to ask Mr. Jackson if he doesn't think the Republican Party could run on the last Democratic platform that was ever written in 1932 better than the present New Deal Party. <laughs> well, that's an imaginary question. You can speak on that if you want to, Mr. Jackson. Well, I think they not only should run on the platform of the Democratic Party, but they should endorse its candidate if they feel as they say they do.
I have heard you say that the New Deal was not calculated to be a benefit to those who lived on their investments rather than upon their services to society. Well, I did not say that. Well, I'm glad to hear it, sir. I wanted to ask you a question. I said that the uh, proposed reduction of taxes was entirely directed to the benefit of those who lived on investments and had no effect on those who lived on wages, salaries, or earned income. And ask this question all feminine to you, sir, in order to let it can be clear. Uh, would you say, then, that it is a democratic philosophy or a philosophy of democratic party that the providing of capitalistic forces of production that are come from investments and uh, dividends is not a service to society? No, sir. Then I didn't say that. I didn't say that, and I don't intend to be understood as saying that. But what I do say is that when you have reached the point where you are living on the return from invested capital, it evidences an ability to pay, and that that is a proper element to take into consideration in fixing the uh, uh, tax rate, that the progressive tax should apply according to ability to pay, graduated according to income. Question for Mr. Frank. A fact. Does Mr. Frank know that Sir Lansing the reaction to the report. Yes. All right. Mr. Landon's reaction to your report. Try to get these candidates lined up behind your report one way or another. <laughs> the, the question is, do I know Mr. Landon's attitude towards this report? Mr. Landon gave his hearty approval to this report in a public statement about 48 hours after it was issued. Uh, Dr. Bester has a question. From out of the town. Yes? Uh, Mr. Jackson, on the issues of foreign policy, what are the major differences between the Republican and Democratic Party? I couldn't answer that because I can't find out what the foreign policy of the Republican Party is. <laughs> not, only, not only are there differences between its candidates, but its candidates sometimes have different policies when they're speaking in different parts of the country. <laughs> I don't think it's feasible or practical to draw a comparison between a policy which is in effect under the present administration with the hypothetical policies of hypothetical candidates uh, drawn from a variety of speeches under a variety of circumstances with no continuity and no consistency among them. <laughs> Mr. Landon, you have Frank. Dr. Frank. Dr. Frank, will you speak to the same question? Again, I'm speaking tonight very dogmatically about Republican policy because of my two years' experience of intimate contact with thousands and thousands of rank-and-file Republicans whose judgment I know is going to prevail ultimately in the Republican Party regardless of what any individual leader may say, think, or do. I know, I, I'm as much at sea as to where the foreign policy of the New Deal is really headed, as Mr. Jackson is, about what the foreign policy of the Republican Party is. If I had to say it in about three or four sentences, I'd say that the demand coming up from the rank and file of the Republicans to the leadership of the Republican Party is, first of all, keep this nation out of the wars of Europe. Second, realize, nevertheless, that this is an interdependent world economically and culturally, and you must go to the extreme limit of cooperation in making possible the easiest possible flow of trade and services across the frontiers of the world, provided in the doing of it you don't have to sell out the living standards of American workers and American farmers. I think Dr. Frank is better qualified to answer this question. How do you uh, reconcile the following essential difference uh, in the uh, situation that's paradoxical? In uh, 1938, President Roosevelt, in speaking before a group of women representing national associations, said that to help recovery, 
quote, by patriotically, end quote. In 1939, President Roosevelt, in speaking before a large group of newspaper men holding forth a can of Argentine beef, said uh, he was advocating that the American Navy buy Argentine beef because it was cheaper. All right, you're asked to verify President Roosevelt's apparently two inconsistent remarks. Mr. Frank. In the spirit of good manners and sportsmanship, I'm going to pass the beef to Mr. Jackson. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Jackson passes the beef back to the audience as we take the next question. Yes. No, I do not. But I, because I am not here to apologize for the leadership of the Republican Party in the past. Because the cold historic record is that most of the political, social, and economic progress that America's made in the last half century has been made under Republican leadership. Or oh, every Republican senator voted against the extension of the reciprocal trade agreement. Is that the rank and file opinion of the Republican Party. I don't think the rank and file sentiment of the Republican Party is a blind blanket thumbs down on the technique of reciprocal trade agreements. I'm not talking about any special one. I think the majority of Republicans in this country are skeptical of the handing over of too much unchecked and unreviewed power to administrators, but they've had such a dose of that in the last seven years that you can forgive them that. Thank you, Mr. Frank. And with your remarks, we bring to a close the 27th and final broadcast of the 1939 season. It's been awfully fine. Uh, Mr. Denny, don't forget to remind our listeners of the special dramatization of the story of America's town meeting in the air. Right. Next Thursday night at the same time, the National Broadcasting Company is presenting a drama which will give our listeners the answer to many of their questions about this broadcast and how it's being used effectively in communities throughout the nation. Finally, we'll take a glimpse at the town meeting of the future. This broadcast is being especially prepared for our town meeting friends, and we know you'll want to hear it. Now, Mr. Hamlin, what about the bulletin? Copies of the bulletin town meeting reporting on this broadcast will be secured for 10 cents each. Better still, subscribe to the bulletin's reporting on all 27 broadcasts of the current season for $2 and a half. Send your order to the Town Hall, 123 West 43rd Street, New York City. Denny, do you have a parting word as the season closes? I wish I could express my appreciation personally to all who contributed to one of the most stimulating and successful seasons we've ever had, particularly to our speakers and the audience here tonight. In addition to the broadcast next week, there will be two special town meetings held next month, one on Thursday evening, May 23rd, in cooperation with the American Association for Adult Education here in this hall, and the other on Thursday evening, May 30th, in cooperation with the American Library Association, which will come to you from Cincinnati. Then we'll begin our regular broadcast next season, mark the date, on Thursday, November 24th. Thanks again to you all, and good night. Next week, the story of America's town meeting of the air. Listen next this has been a public service feature of the Blue Network of the National Broadcasting Company and its associated stations and came to you from Town Hall, New York City. <laughs>